what what is your viewpoint on on using tariffs in any way whether is there a time and place for it or, and, and we do have the rest of the country still has some on us uh, we've never resorted to it before but is there a time and place for it I think in in specific extreme circumstances there are but it is a step that has as your previous segments described uh, a very disruptive effect on a large number of commercial arrangements that have been crucial to the development of, of growth throughout the world. Uh, and it is an area where others can punch back. So you set in motion a process, uh, which one of your colleagues mentioned a moment ago, in which you can't really predict what will take place. And some of the surprises can come back to bite you pretty hard. Do you have uh, anecdotal evidence of how it's playing out right now or how you expect it to play out? And how long it, it, is it going to be the permanent state of affairs? for us, uh, at least till 2020? I don't. I, I, it, for years, I think all of us who've been approving of the development of greater global integration have thought that the sides uh, at each point of friction would ultimately sit down and reassess, would realize the benefits that came from this. But I think those assumptions no longer hold. So from week to week, from month to month, you can have stunning adjustments in the process. So. 2020, maybe beyond, uh, it's really hard to tell now. Um, I, I mean, they, the rest of the world has not removed barriers to trade unilaterally before. It takes two to tango, doesn't it? I mean, they, should we just sit there and, and, and just be subjected to it? Or, I mean, you have, in no way do you think anything is warranted at this point? You wouldn't have, you wouldn't have uh, taken the tack that we have with China? I think a lot of commentators have pointed out areas in which the U.S. Uh, has been put to disadvantage by a number of practices of the People's Republic. And I think in selected areas, that has been an appropriate area for negotiation. And I share your view that simply standing back and doing nothing is not an effective strategy. But I turn back to the approach that uh, has been used in the past, which is usually involved uh, difficult negotiations, but not the the shocking adjustment that we've seen in, in, in the recent past. So I would, I would, I, I agree with the idea that there can be a point at which a, a jolt to the existing relationship can change things. The question is, are things reset in a way that bring back into play the kind of intensive behind the scenes negotiations that have been useful in the past? So what worries you more, that, that we're the Huawei situation or the antitrust uh, approach to, to big tech now by, by the U.S. government? Are both of these things uh, a, a stumbling block for, for innovation here in this country? I think the Huawei situation, the battle over trade, is a more significant issue. The way in which related practices involving privacy, data protection, are far more serious threats to the development of an effective, innovative process throughout the world. The antitrust circumstances are important and have to be taken seriously, but compared to data protection, cybersecurity, I'd rank them uh, as a secondary concern. If they ask you to rewrite the uh, monopoly laws, how would you do it so that it would um, suggest some remedies for Google or Apple? Or I, I don't even, they're, they're not all the same either, or Facebook or Amazon. It, I don't know how you would write something that, I, I don't know, that, that updates antitrust law for, for the current uh, environment. Do you know how to do that? I, I wouldn't change the law. The, the law is extraordinarily scale, scalable and adaptable. That's by design. Uh, the real change has to come in the way in which our enforcement agencies go about developing programs, the way in which they cooperate with other government bodies, and the way in which our courts view the behavior. So we have an antitrust platform that is highly adaptable. The real question is, can it be implemented in a way that's effective? Because the authorities do have tools at their disposal to do this. The question is, will there be the will and the capacity to make this scalable system effective? Which, which, which side, and, it, and you know, it's, it's a political uh, year, obviously, I guess every year is, uh, but the approach you hear from, from the left, Elizabeth Warren, just just for lack of a better uh, a spokesperson, but take her approach versus the light touch that you might see from classic Republicans. I'm not sure about the Trump administration, but, but who's on the right track for, for making sure that we don't, and I say this so many times, I might patent it, but we don't want to kill the goose that lays the golden egg. We have such great tech companies here uh, versus the rest of the world. We don't want to screw that up. What, what should we do? 
I think there's, there's a synthesis of these two positions. Senator Warren is right to raise issues. It's time and useful to have a rethink of what we've been doing. The more cautious approach that you see from the other direction uh, raises questions about how you're going to do this, exactly what techniques will you use to make adjustments so that the question of policy implementation and impact is kept in mind away. Uh, so that ten tends, I think, to point us away from Grand Slam solutions like breaking up existing tech companies. It points us more in the direction of more targeted interventions that focus on conduct. And it raises the possibility that the simple fact that we have investigations and maybe lawsuits running by themselves has the effect of opening up opportunities for other companies to participate. So Senator Warren performs a useful service in raising the issue. The more cautious, conservative approach of a number of Republicans, some Democrats, is to temper the means that we'll use to address them. That could produce an acceptable result. Who's being harmed right now? I, I, I guess, you know, I've made this point a lot. It, it's just hard for me as a consumer to feel harmed because a lot of what I use I, is free. I, I guess they're stealing my, my information and my privacy, and maybe I don't, they're selling it and advertisers are buying it and things like that. But. That's why I thought maybe we have to rewrite something, because it now looks like we're, we're headed towards a European uh, mode where you worry about competitors, not necessarily consumers. Are, are new entrants into the technology being uh, hurt by the size and power of, of the big fang stocks? I'd say the single thing that raises uh, an area of consensus around a number of observers is that there seems to have been a drop off in new startups over the last 10 years, that we're seeing fewer firms coming into the market and stimulating continuing developments in this extraordinarily vi vibrant commercial ecology. So the main competitive concern I would identify for consumers is that we're not having the same level of vitality that we've had in the past. Now, I have to concede that is a, that is a subtle effect that most consumers can't see now. We tend to notice the price that we like, the variety that we have, in many ways, the concerns being raised by those who say, turn up the antitrust system, is that we are seeing a reduction in the number of entrants that are going to contest the position of incumbents. That's going to reduce innovation in the long term. And over the years, that's what we'll suffer for.